In Lecture 4, we established the foundations of calculus. In this lecture, we begin to apply calculus to solving various economic problems. In economics, we mostly want to find the best outcome, the least cost outcome, or perhaps the profit-maximizing solution to a problem. These are optimization problems. We want to determine the maximum or the minimum value of a function, and to show that it is in fact a maximum or a minimum value. In this lecture, we'll examine how to find the maximum or minimum of a univariate function. In later lectures, we'll consider multivariate optimization and constrained optimization. Of course, if we're looking for an extreme point, we need to find the domain. We have a point C, and the value of the function at point C is greater than all the other values of the function over the domain, D. And then we have a maximum point. If, on the other hand, f of c has the lowest value of all the values of the function f of x over the domain d, then we have a minimum point. Since we're considering the whole domain of the function, these are global extreme points. We'll see later that we can also have local minima and local maxima. We have some more maths notation here. So that inverted a means for all x. So for all x, there are elements of the domain d. This is how that looks graphically. We have a function, y equals f of x. We have the domain we've specified there, some point c, where f of c is the largest value of the function over that domain. And similarly for minus f of x, c will be a global minimum point. As we saw in lecture four, when a differentiable function has a maximum or a minimum, the first derivative is equal to zero. Points where dy dx is equal to zero are called stationary points. We have two examples there. However, not all stationary points are maxima or minima. We can have a special case of an inflection point where the first derivative is zero. We'll examine inflection points in module four, and we'll see that not all inflection points are stationary points. That's why it's a special case. Going back to maxima and minima, if extreme points are stationary points, we have a way of finding them. We take the first derivative of the function and set it equal to zero. Solving for x gives us the stationary points. This is known as the first order condition. To find a stationary point on a differentiable function, we take the first derivative and set it equal to zero. The value of x we obtain, c, could be a maximum or a minimum. We see by our definition that c is an interior point over the interval i. Why is c an interior point? We know from lecture four that a differentiable function is smooth and continuous. At either end of the domain, the function is no longer continuous, so c can't be an endpoint. Why is the first order condition a necessary condition? As we saw in previous slides, not all stationary points are either a maximum or a minimum. They could be inflection points. However, all maxima and minima are stationary points. Here are a couple of examples. The first example shows a function that's not differentiable over its entire domain. Nevertheless, there's an extreme point at the minimum, x equals 2. The function is continuous but not smooth, so we can't use the first order condition. The first derivative at x equals 2 is undefined. Our second example is from biology. Medical doctors are interested in the concentration of a drug in the bloodstream over time. So we have a function. See if t is equal to t over t squared plus 4. Here's the entire function. However, time t equals zero represents the time the drug is injected. So our domain is t greater than or equal to zero. How does a doctor determine when the concentration is a maximum? We have our function. We take the first derivative by applying the quotient rule. We can simplify. And now we can factorize the numerator. Now we have the first derivative. Our first order condition then says that we solve for c prime t. We have our first derivative. Our first order condition is to solve for t when the first derivative is equal to zero. On the face of it, this looks like a difficult function to solve. However, if we look at it a bit more carefully, we can find a solution. Remember our domain is t greater than or equal to zero. So our denominator is always positive, greater than zero. 2 plus t will also be always positive. So that leaves this term. The first derivative will equal 0 when t is equal to 2. So we have our first order condition, and we know we have a stationary point at t equals 2. How can we tell if that's a maximum or a minimum if we don't look at the graph? 
Well, that term 2 minus t also determines the sine of the first derivative. Let's construct a simple sine diagram then for our function. For t between 0 and 2, 2 minus t will be positive, so the first derivative will be positive. For t greater than 2, 2 minus t will be negative, so the first derivative will be negative. So if we have our function ct increasing in the interval 0 to 2 and decreasing in the interval 2 to infinity. If 0 to infinity is the entire domain of our function, then we conclude that the functions are maximum at point t equals 2. Below 2 the function is increasing and above 2 the function is decreasing. So we have the maximum at t equals 2. We know it's a global maximum because that's the whole domain of our function from 0 to plus infinity. So here we have a simple test for global extreme points. If our first derivative is one sign below c and the other sign above c, then we'll either have a maximum or a minimum. If the first derivative goes from positive to negative, as we saw there, we'll have a, a maximum. If the first derivative goes from a negative to a positive at c, then we'll have a minimum. If the interval we're considering is the domain of the function, then these are global extreme points. Later we'll consider the second order condition for determining whether a stationary point is a maximum or a minimum. Sometimes this test is simpler. In example 2, we saw determining the sign of the first derivative was relatively easy, while calculating the second derivative would be much harder. If there's a point C such that the first derivative is one sign below C and the other sign above C, we can apply the simple test for a global extreme point. If on the other hand the second derivative is easy to calculate, and it's plain that it's always positive or always negative, we can use the concepts of convexity and concavity to determine whether we have a global maximum or minimum. Recall if the second derivative is always positive, we have a convex function. If the second derivative is always negative, we have a concave function. So another simple test for global extrema is if we know we have a concave function or a convex function, we know we have a global extreme point. If the function f is a concave function in the interval i and c is a stationary point for f in the interior of i, then c is a maximum point for f in i. Similarly, a convex function is a minimum. And if i is the domain of the function, then c is a global maximum or a global minimum. So far, we've just assumed that the function will have global extreme points. That's not really good enough for maths. The extreme value theorem proves that for a closed and bounded function, there will be a global maximum and global minimum. As the textbook says, the proof is fairly complicated, but the result is simple. A function is closed if it contains the endpoints a and b. It's bounded if it doesn't go off to infinity somewhere. In other words, you can draw a circle of some size around the graph of the function. If our function is closed and bounded over the interval, then we know there will be a global maximum and a global minimum. In other words, combined, these conditions are sufficient conditions for global extreme points. If a function is closed and bounded, there will be global extreme points. However, they aren't necessary conditions. There are functions that are not closed or not bounded, or both, that have global extreme points. So how do we find global extreme points? This is the general procedure in three steps. First, we find all the interior stationary points of the function in the interval a, b. Then we evaluate the function at all the stationary points and at the endpoints a and b of the interval. The next step is fairly straightforward. The largest value of f in step 2 is the maximum, and the smallest value of f in step 2 is the minimum. Before we go on to an example, let's look at a couple of cases where we don't have extreme points. In example 1, we have a function that's not closed and not bounded. We see we have a half open interval there. And here, our function heads off to infinity. There's no way we can draw a circle around the graph of that function. The second example is a little trickier. We have a closed interval, 0 to 5. But our function is discontinuous at x equals 3. And also, the interval 0 to 3 is not closed.
Now go to the video for example 3 and we'll put those ideas into practice.